is one of the great predators of the sky, a gray-winged angel of death gliding over the modern battlefields. On paper, the Bayraktar TB2 may not seem particularly impressive. A Turkish manufactured drone or UAV is about the size and shape of a crop duster with top speeds to match. Although armed with four laser-guided bombs, it seems like the sort of thing any halfway competent military should be able to knock out of the sky with, well, ease. Yet somehow this doesn't happen, or at least it happens rarely enough that the remaining drones are still able to find their targets. And when they do, it's game over for whatever happens to be in their way. Intensely lethal, TB2s have played pivotal roles in multiple recent conflicts. In Nagorno-Karabakh, they allowed the Azeris to claim victory. In Ethiopia, they stopped Tigrayan forces from breaching the capital. In the early days of the Ukraine war, they helped unleash chaos on Russia's ill-prepared troops. But how is this possible? How is it that these budget drones, the UAV equivalent of Ryanair, are able to dominate the modern battlefield? Answers after the title. Let me interrupt today's video to tell you about our wonderful sponsor, and that would be Surfshark VPN. Look, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> VPNs, it sounds complicated and technical, but it's not. It's super easy when you use Surfshark. Surfshark solves a problem that we all face in today's world, protecting our internet activity. And I'll tell you, it's easier than ever with Surfshark. In just a few clicks, you are good to go. I fussed around with other VPNs in the past that were complicated. It's not the case with Surfshark. With Surfshark, you stay private, you get all of the VPN perks without the hassle, and without breaking the bank, it's really super affordable. Surfshark lets you access content from anywhere in the world, wherever you are. You can just virtually travel with one click and change your IP address. This allows you to see bigger movie catalogs on popular streaming sites and also get different shopping options no matter where you are. And the best part is that Surfshark integrates seamlessly into your online experience. Plus, it keeps all of your private information secure. And speaking of security, Surfshark protects you on public Wi-Fi too, so whether you're a cafe goer, a traveler, just uh, out having a wander, you can browse with confidence. Plus, you can send or receive files securely and get the best deals when shopping online. They've also got Surfshark Alert, Antivirus, and Search as add-ons. So if you're ready to protect your internet access, stay safe on public Wi-Fi and access content from anywhere in the world, go to surfshark.deals forward slash mega and use the promo code MEGA for 83% off and three months for free. And now back to today's video. At first glance, it looks like little more than a small grey airplane. The sort of one propeller thing that you might see floating over the crop fields of the Midwest. But this is no ordinary light plane. It's an unmanned aerial vehicle or UAV. Specifically, a medium altitude long endurance tactical UAV armed with laser guided bombs. And while it may pale in comparison beside sophisticated American drones like the Predator or the Reaper, the Bioreactor TB2 is certainly no poor man's knockoff. Since 2016, it has been influencing the outcome of conflicts around the globe. According to the manufacturer, there are currently 257 TB2s in operation worldwide. Most are owned by Turkey, Qatar, Ukraine, and Azerbaijan, but other nations have put in orders too. Right now, Poland has a contract to purchase 24 of them. Romania is buying 18, Morocco 13, Niger at least 6, Kosovo 5, and then a whole bunch of nations from Albania to Burkina Faso have placed smaller orders for just three. What's driving these nations from Europe to Africa to Asia to splurge on this one drone is a combination of things. Fear of missing out on a technological breakthrough, the bad record of Chinese-made UAVs, particularly in Africa. But a big part of it is surely the TB2's impressive history. Open source intelligence blog Oryx lists 913 confirmed targets destroyed by the Bayraktar TB2s in the seven years they've been militarily active. This includes in conflicts ranging from the Middle East to the Caucasus to West Africa to the battlefields of Ukraine. Undoubtedly, that number will soon skyrocket. Unlike the United States, Turkey attaches no conditions to those it sells drones to. That means that they could soon be cropping up in conflicts on nearly every continent. Okay, so this seems like the perfect time to get to know it a bit better. Standing at 2.2 meters with a wingspan of 12 meters, that's 39 feet in Liberty units, the first thing to note about the TB2 is that it's relatively small, only slightly over half the size of American Reaper drones. That means it can easily be transported on the back of a regular truck. Not that owners have to get too close to the front lines to launch. With a communication range of 300 kilometers or nearly 190 miles, TB2s can stay aloft for a maximum of 27 hours and 3 minutes. Cruising at 128 kilometers an hour, a full 7,500 meters above the Earth. 
That's just cruising speed, though. If necessary, these UAVs can accelerate to 222 kilometers an hour. That's equivalent to 120 knots. Again, this is nothing compared to what a top-of-the-range US military drone can achieve. But that's sort of the point. Compared to other UAVs on the market, the TB2 is intended to be the budget option, the Walmart of unmanned flying death machines. According to a New York profile of the drone's creator, TB2s, quote, are sold as a platform along with portable command stations and communications equipment. The same piece went on to note that a typical price might be that paid by Ukraine in 2019. $69 million for six TB2s plus command stations, training and servicing. Now look, $69 million is obviously a ton of money. The sort of money that most of us will never see in our lifetimes. For a national military though, it represents a bit of a bargain. Buying half a dozen Reaper drones is going to save you back almost six times as much, and you'll have to be on Uncle Sam's nice list to even make an offer. Turkey, meanwhile, will sell drones to just about anyone. Sometimes with a steep discount, if, like Nigeria, you've got minerals Ankara is desperate to get its hands on. In return, buyers get one of the most terrifying things to ever grace the sky. One of the weirdest things about the Bayraktar TB2 is that it really shouldn't work at all. Despite its top speed of 222 kilometers an hour, the craft's regular cruise speed is significantly slower. So slow that lumbering is an adjective frequently used to describe it. Nor does its maximum altitude compare to an American Reaper, which can reach 15,000 meters, that's around 50,000 feet. And that should be a problem, because drones have been around for so long now that most militaries have countermeasures, not just air defenses, but also jamming and electronic warfare systems. When the TB2 first appeared on the battlefield, bombing Kurdish militants, experts assumed it was useful for counterinsurgency operations, but would suck in conventional warfare. It was flying so low and so slow that enemies would just blast it out of the sky. Fast forward seven years, though, and it's clear this simply does not happen, at least not on the scale that everyone foresaw. Now, that's not to say TB2s are never downed by enemy fire. In the Ukraine war alone, Oryx has documented 18 of them being shot down. Still, the original assumption wasn't that some TB2s would be shot down in a serious conflict, but that they all would. Instead, the UAV has proven remarkably adept at not just evading advanced air defenses, but destroying them. As Oryx summed up, TB2s have successfully combated systems such as the S300PS, Buck M2, Tor M2, Panzer S1, even when used in conjunction with electronic warfare EW systems like the Avto Bazar M, Repellent 1, Boris Ogilv S2, and Grozer S. In this, the TB2 is helped by both its weapons and its software. On the software side, each UAV contains around 40 computers, all of which receive multiple monthly updates to keep them ahead of improvements to air defenses. On the weaponry side, the four guided bombs each carries are terrifyingly accurate. In tests in 2015, the bombs were able to hit something the size of a picnic blanket from a distance of 8 kilometers. Nor do they just fly straight there. Each one can change trajectory while in mid-air. For a budget option, this is really rather nifty. As a consequence of stuff like this, the 43-year-old designer of the TB2, Selçuk Bayraktar, is today something of a celebrity in Turkey. To be fair, it probably helps that he's married to the daughter of longtime time Erdogan. But at least part of this has to be to do with the performance of his drone, which has become a major tool of Turkish diplomacy. I mean, just look at Ukraine. There, the successes of the TB2 in the first few months of the war were so legendary that people wrote folk songs about it. Animals in Kiev Zoo were named Bayraktar in honor of the machine's designer. It's not the only time something similar has happened in the Ukraine war. A giant mural named Saint Javelin likewise appeared in Kiev in honor of the anti-tank missile. Nonetheless, it does speak to the peculiar way people view the TB2, with a combination of awe, affection, and stone-cold fear. It was April 2016 when the TB2 hit an important milestone for any weapons platform. That month, it recorded its first confirmed kill. The setting was Turkey's mountainous southeastern region. The context was the ongoing counterinsurgency by Kurdish separatists PKK against the Turkish state. Over the course of multiple flights, TB2s used their precision missiles to take out something in the region of 20 PKK leaders badly damaging the organization, a terror group as prescribed by the US, EU, and UK. By this point, the drone had been in the manufacturing and testing stage for about two years. But its origin could be traced back even further, perhaps as far back as a decade. That's because it was in the mid-2000s that Seltruk Bayraktar's company, Bayraktar Design, began to concentrate on building drones for military purposes. 
The original in this category had been something called the Mini UAV. Rather than an attack drone, the Mini was a simple reconnaissance device, one that weighed under 10 kilograms and could stay aloft for slightly more than an hour. Considering that the first commercial drones were by then already becoming available, this wasn't super impressive. Yet it was just the start. As newer versions of the Mini were made, improving upon the original, it began to work better and better as a spy drone. Eventually, it got so good that Qatar would place an order. But the real change would be when the company switched its focus from reconnaissance to attack. Come 2014, the first TB2 prototype was undergoing flight tests ahead of its modifications to start carrying bombs. In many ways, it was the timing that would make the UAV such a hit. About 20 years ago, Ankara seems to have realized that its own defense industrial base was sorely lacking, leaving it reliant on allies to provide a kit. What followed was a government drive to grow the local arms industry. In two decades, the sector would grow by a factor of 10 as the Turkish military desperately tried to onshore production of as much stuff as possible. That meant Baikar Defense was perfectly placed to ride this wave of money, becoming Ankara's go-to company for UAVs. And that meant the first TB2s would be ready for the military to use as soon as it needed them. The same year the UAV scored its first kill against the PKK, ISIS unleashed a wave of terror across Turkey, culminating in a gun and bomb attack on Istanbul airport that killed nearly 50 people. Shortly after the first TB2s to run missions outside Turkey's airspace took to the skies, their destination? Syria, where the chaos of the civil war had allowed a brutal caliphate to metastasize. The following years saw the drones rain death down upon Islamic State, just as they had upon the PKK. With brutal efficiency, their guided bombs dispatched jihadists as part of Turkey's anti-ISIS campaign. Yet while the TB2s performed well, it was hard to imagine them doing otherwise. Like the PKK, ISIS were an irregular group of fighters, one that managed to seize large reserves of golden weapons, but they were far from an advanced army. No, if the TB2 was going to prove itself in battle, it would need to do so against a real military, one backed by a nation state, one fielding anti-aircraft systems designed to knock UAVs out of the sky. As the 2010s gave way to a new decade, the TB2 would finally get its chance. To call the relationship between Turkey and Russia complicated or would be like calling the Hindenburg disaster a bit of a bummer. While Ankara buys Moscow's military equipment and nuclear power technology, the two also have a frequently brutal rivalry that comes from trying to shape themselves as major regional powers. Famously, this has included backing different sides in multiple wars, multiple wars in which the TB2 has helped give Turkey's candidate the necessary edge. The first major time this happened was across the years 2019 to 2020. As the decade of the 2010s closed out, Libyan warlord Khalifa Haftar decided to make a move against the internationally recognized government in Tripoli. In this, he was backed by powerful regional allies, Egypt and the UAE, as well as Vladimir Putin in Moscow. As his Libyan national army advanced, Haftar must have assumed sweet victory was mere days away. But it wasn't to be. While the Russians furnished Haftar with Panzer S-1 air defense systems, TB2s were still able to attack, ultimately destroying nine of them. This punched a hole in the LNA's air defenses, allowing direct attacks on convoys approaching the Libyan capital. Backed up by Turkish warships firing surface-to-air missiles from the Mediterranean, the Tripoli government was eventually able to chase Haftar all the way back to his power base in the east of the country. It was an astonishing victory, one rightly celebrated by the Libyan government. And while it would be going too far to give the TB2 all the credit, it certainly played a major role in ending Haftar's offensive. Just two years later, TB2s would help deliver a similar outcome in a completely different war. This time, the drones helped stop a 2021 advance on the Ethiopian capital of Addis Ababa by the Tigray People's Liberation Front, perhaps the key battle in the bloody and horrifying Tigray War. But it would be in a conflict that landed between these two African civil wars that the TB2 really made its name. When it arrived in the international consciousness in much the same way as the word Blitzkrieg did in 1939. When the TB2 almost single-handedly won Azerbaijan the Second Nagorno-Karabakh War. Now, the ins and outs of the war are super complicated, involving ethnic Armenians trapped inside Azerbaijan's borders after the fall of the USSR, forging their own breakaway state with Iran's backing. And if you want to learn more, we did a whole video about it on the War of Graphics channel. For now, for this video, though, the important part is that Armenia was backed by Moscow and operating Russian equipment. Azerbaijan, meanwhile, was backed by Turkey. 
And that meant, when war broke out in the fall of 2020, that Baku was fielding a fleet of DB2s. The outcome of the war was perhaps best summed up by Oryx with the following statement. In the course of this short but intense conflict, a handful of Azerbaijani Bayraktar TB2s UCAVs essentially broke the back of the Armenian military. Their team documented the destruction of 549 ground targets by the drones, ranging from 22 SAM systems to 126 armored fighting vehicles, a tally that includes 90 T-72 main battle tanks. A huge part of this was the element of surprise. Analyst Rob Lee has written on how Azerbaijan used its drones to destroy Armenia's air defenses within hours of the war starting. But an equally big part was sheer technological superiority. Despite the size and slowness of the drones, Armenia was unable to shoot most of them down. At times, radar and jamming equipment appeared to fail at its job while within eyesight of TB2s. By the end of the six-week conflict, things had gotten so bad that Armenian soldiers no longer hid from the UAVs, but simply walked out in the open while keeping a vast distance from comrades. The reasoning being that since they couldn't escape the UAVs, they might as well show the operators that they were alone, and thus not worth the expense of a missile. Impressive as the TB2's record in the conflict was, though, the war was also notable for something else. As the scale of the UAV's successes became apparent, Azerbaijan's dictator started playing footage of strikes on giant screens in the nation's capital. It was perfect foreshadowing of the strange fame that the TB2 would achieve in its next great conflict. <laughs> The first weeks of the Ukraine war were like a greatest hits replay of everything anyone had ever said about the TB2. As the first missiles crashed into Kiev on February 24, 2022, analysts and experts lined up to declare that the lumbering Turkish drones would be unable to match the firepower of Russia's forces, that within hours all 20 UAVs that Ukraine had purchased would be destroyed. Of course, many of these were the same people who said that Ukraine would fall within 72 hours, who assured us that there was literally no way that Moscow's military could fail. So you can probably guess how their TB2 prediction went. What followed were several weeks in which the UAVs seemed to repeat their successes from Libya, Ethiopia, and Nagorno-Karabakh, flying low, evading radar, and only appearing to strike Russian air defenses or advancing columns. At one point, things got so bad that the Russian ambassador in Ankara felt compelled to lash out against Turkey's government, declaring explanations like business is business won't work since your drones are killing our soldiers. The weirdest part? Russia knew Kyiv had access to these UAVs. Prior to the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, it had spent months training pilots to knock them out of the sky. And now here they were, blowing up Russian trucks, killing Russian soldiers, all while the Kremlin flailed around, unable to stop the carnage. For Ukrainians, the drone's effectiveness turned the TB2 into a legend. In this era, in the early days of the war, the sight of TB2s annihilating Russian convoys was a source of hope, something residents of Kiev could take comfort in as they awaited in air raid shelters for the missiles to stop falling. This was when folk songs began to be written about the UAV, when zoo animals and pets were named Bayraktar. There was even a concerted campaign in neighboring Lithuania to raise 5 million euros to buy Ukraine an extra TB2. When the money was raised in just three days, the manufacturer waived the fee and sent the drone to Kiev for free. Spectacular as all of this was, though, it didn't alter the main fundamental rule of war. No matter how great a technological leap, a well-funded army will eventually find a way to counter it. Today, deep into the Ukraine war's second year, I no longer hear so much about the role of TB2s. Partially, that's because the nature of war has shifted from a hurried defense against rolling columns of armor to grinding advances and trench warfare reminiscent of World War I. From combat on fields and roads to close quarters urban fighting. Partially, though, it's also because Moscow's abilities at jamming and electronic warfare have dramatically improved. Although there remains a place for larger combat drones, they are no longer as effective as they once were. Even in retrospect, the role of TB2s in the opening days of the war is no longer seen in quite the same light. Whereas videos on Twitter and TikTok in early 2022 focused on the damage done to Russia's forces by drones, javelin missiles, and end laws, the 2023 assessment is that it was good old-fashioned artillery that saved Kiev from conquest. Still, that doesn't mean the story of the TB2 is over. As you watch this, countries all around the world are scrambling to buy the sky-based killing machine to prepare themselves for the future of combat in a world where war will only ever become more automated. That means 
the next few years should feature more conflicts where this ingenious budget UAV stalks through the skies looking for prey. A UAV that can tilt the balance of power away from an expected victor. There's no doubt that eventually the TB2 will become outmoded, replaced by better models, as happens to all kit. For now, though, it remains a fascinating, deadly weapon, a kind of platform driving innovations in a whole new kind of warfare. Where that will lead the militaries of the world next is something we shall have to wait to find out.